Well, when Sarah assigned me Deborah, I did not pick Deborah. Um, I picked a date, and she said, oh, good, you're going to do Deborah. And I was like, Deborah, OK. How many of you are familiar with Deborah, the story of Deborah? Good. We do have some people that are. I will say I knew some vague things, but I, did, I was not very familiar. And I think that's just like the Lord, right? To give us something that we're not familiar with so that we can dig into the scriptures and, and learn all about it. So um, as we go through the lesson today, I do want to spend some time not just in Deborah, Deb, or not just with Deborah, the character of Deborah, but as a whole, the book of Judges. I think it's really important um, to look at the context of what's going on, especially because not a lot of us are very familiar with this, uh, the book of Judges, maybe. And I think it's important to kind of see who the judges were, um, what the judges did, and, and just kind of um, look at it that way before we dig into the character of Deborah herself. So um, there's going to be a lot of details that I'm not going to be able to cover today. So I really would encourage you, if you're looking for a good book to read, find a good commentary and um, a good study Bible and dig into the book of Judges. I know I'm going to be looking into it even further because it's really sparked an interest for me in um, looking at this book even further after doing some of the research and study for this lesson. Um, so we'll start off by saying that Judges is a very graphic and disturbing book. Um, it's not like the beautiful Psalms and Proverbs or the beautiful story of what um, has been covered so far, just these beautiful, lovely women that, you know, have such a heroic tale. And in some ways it does, but Judges is a very disturbing book. Um, and it's telling of the story of is Israel's failure and repetitive sin, um, the disregard of God and his law, um, a repetitive, repetitive verses that we see over and over again in the book of Judges, especially in the first couple chapters, is um, that the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, I don't know how many times in, in the beginning of each section of your Bible in the first couple chapters of Judges, you just keep seeing that. People did what was evil in the sight of the Lord over and over and over again. It's like the author is really trying to emphasize that. Um, there was great need for a king. There was, Israel had no king at this time, um, but there was great need for a godly leader. Um, and as new generations of Israelites came up, they would forget the God of their father. Um, even though this book is very disturbing and sad in many ways, it's also very hopeful because it can show us how God can take failure and sin and work in the midst of it. And I won't get to cover the end. There's so much more that I won't get to cover in Judges, but Judges is basically like spiraling downward. So it starts disturbing, and then it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse until the end of the book. You're kind of appalled at what's happening. Um, so the book begins after Joshua, having just led the Israelites into the Promised Land, has died. The Lord told Judah to go and defeat the Canaanites. Now the Canaanites were... Uh, pagans who worshipped different gods, and even, even some of them did, uh, did this through child sacrifice and just very disturbing things. So Judah and Simeon did as the Lord said, and the Lord gave the Canaanites, I'm sorry, so Judah and Simeon did as the Lord said, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Pezrites into their hand, um, and they defeated 10,000 men. I, I'm sorry, I think I skipped a part. The Lord told Judah to go and defeat the Canaanites. And um, Judah and Simeon did as the Lord said, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and Pezrites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 men. So the Lord is telling them, telling the Israelites to go into the land and drive out all the Canaanites, drive out all the pagans. Um, they went into Jerusalem, and then they captured it, and they set it on fire. And from there, the brothers go on into different cities, fighting to drive out the Canaanites um, within the land. And although there was some effort in driving the pagan people groups out, the Israelites, of course, did not fully obey God. Um, in chapter 1, we see over and over again, I have listed chapter 1, verses 19, 21, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Over and over again, um, the Lord gives examples of um, how the Canaanites continued to leave um, 
many Canaanites to still dwell within the land. Um, the Israelites also, because of this, slowly began to adopt their wicked lifestyle and their sinful ways. Um, and because of this, they would easily forget about Yahweh and all that he had done. Um, actually, in most cases in the book of Judges, you can't even really see a difference between the Israelites and other nations because their lifestyle um, looked so similar. Now, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, God gave um, the Israelites a warning. He said he would never break his covenant with his people and also that they would never make a covenant um, with the inhabitants of this land. However, because they disobeyed, he warned them that their enemies would be a thorn in their side and that their gods would snare them. So at this warning, the Israelites basically cried out in anguish to God. Um, now, as the Lord raises up judges, because Israel had no king, after Joshua died, God appoints and raises up judges. Now, the judges, it's hard to get a clear understanding of what a judge was because it's such a foreign thing to us. We don't really know, have a person that would act as a judge now. Um, but judges basically were political and military leaders. The word judge comes from a Hebrew word, shafatim, which means putting right and to rule. And this is exactly what they did during this time. So I want to briefly discuss um, a few of the judges up to the point in, uh, of Deborah in chapters 4 and 5. So there are eight other judges that follow Deborah, but obviously I'm not going to have time to get to those today. But we will touch on a few of them. So the first judge um, that we're going to look at is a judge called Othniel. Othniel is the first judge raised up by the Lord. Um, he was the son of Kenaz. And in chapter 10, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He went to war and he prevailed, and so Israel had rest against their enemy for 40 years. So you'll kind of see a trend that... Um, God would raise up a judge, the judge would be with them, the, the um, army would conquer the enemy, and then Israel would be blessed, and they would have peace, at least for a short amount of time. Um, then, of course, after their peace and their short amount of just comfort and, um, and comfortability, um, they would soon then, in turn, forget about God again. Then he would raise up another judge by his grace. Um, he raised up the second judge named Ehud, okay? Now, my husband would say his name was Ehud because he was hood. <laughs> you would have to know my husband to get that probably. But, um, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Ehud was getting ready to pay tribute to the king of Moab. Now, Moab was a ginormously fat man, as the Bible describes. I couldn't uh, go through this lesson without telling a little bit of what happens in this story. Um, so before their visit, Ehud, the judge, made himself a, a sword and bound it under his right thigh, under his clothes. And when he finished presenting a tribute to the king, Ehud told the king that he had a secret for him. And he sent all the attendants out of the room. Ehud then reached over and pulled the sword from his side and thrust it into the body, the belly of the king. Judges 3.22 tells a very graphic um, tale of this. It says, And the hilt of the sword also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and dung came out. Isn't the Bible just, just epic? Okay. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. And when he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's just relieving himself and in the, um, in the closet in the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But then he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber. So they took the key and they opened it, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. So the Israelites went on then to conquer 10,000 Moabites, um, and had rest for 80 years, which was actually a long period of rest for them and peace for them. 
So moving on to the third judge, um, Shamgar. The Bible doesn't really give a lot about Shamgar. It's only just like a verse, I think, a couple verses there. Um, but we know that he killed 600 Philistines and saved Israel. Now, I did look into this a little bit. Um, historians do have reason to believe, based off of several things, but one of them being Shamgar's name, that he may have not actually been an Israelite at all. Um, they believe that he could have been an Egyptian that had um, enmity against the Philistines, so he was willing to act as a judge and that the Lord used him um, to preserve Israel even more. Um, but that is speculation. That is not in the Bible. Um, so finally, we can move to our fifth judge that we'll be talking about today, Deborah. Now, the Bible starts by describing Deborah as a prophetess and as a wife. So those are the two kind of the things that are, uh, at first, the Bible describes her as. She was the wife of Lapida, and much like Miriam, who we just learned about, <clears throat> I believe it was last week or the week before, um, Deborah was vital in leading the Israelites out of trouble that they often found themselves in. She was known to sit under a palm tree, and the people came up to her for judgment and to settle disputes. Now at this time, the Lord had sold Israel into the, king, into the hands of King Jobin of Hazor, and his armor, army commander was Sisera. So I'm going to set this up. I know I told Jonathan, I'm like, this is probably going to be really boring to some people. But I want to set this up. So um, King Jobin was the king at the time of Hazor, and he had a commander underneath him named Sisera. Um, the Israelites cried out to the Lord because Jobin had a huge, huge army. He had 900 iron chariots and had been oppressing the Israelites for more than 20 years. So Deborah called to a man named Barak and told him that the Lord was calling upon him to gather 10,000 troops and to go up to Mount Tabor to fight Sisera and his men. The Israelites were up against the largest and most heavily armed soldiers in the entire book of Judges. So when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking of like Lord of the Rings where you have like this huge, um, ferocious army. And then, you know, you have, you know, this tiny little group of 10,000 men that have hardly any weapons, but that's just the way the Lord works, right? He delivers people in those um, situations. And the, the Israelites were up against the largest and most heavily armed soldiers. And Deborah told Barak that God would lure Sisera, who was the commander, and his troops to fight against them, and that God would hand them over, hand the enemy over to them. And Barak replied to Deborah that he would only go if she would go with him. Now, there are two opinions about this. One would be, Barak kind of sounds like a chump, right? He kind of sounds like a coward, um, that he's only going to go if she goes with him. But other opinions, other people would say that maybe he was smart by wanting her to go with him because, obviously, Deborah was an anointed judge, and who wouldn't want somebody, a judge, an anointed um, prophetess to go with him into battle. So you can obviously kind of determine that for yourself. But um, she agreed to go with him, and then she prophesied that he would lead the army, but he would receive no honor for their victory. But God would put the victory into the hands of a woman. Barak took his men into battle, and Deborah encouraged him with the promises from the Lord, saying, in verse 4:14, go, this is the day the Lord has handed Sisera over to you. Hasn't the Lord gone before you? The Lord then threw Sisera and his men into a panic before Barak's assault, and Sisera fled from his army by foot. So he was actually the coward. He left his army, and he fled by foot. Barak and his men then pursued Sisera's army, and not a single man was left alive. So Israel was able to conquer the 900 chariot, chariots. Um, but meanwhile, Sisera, um, the, the commander of Jobin's army, had fled by foot, and he found a safe haven at the tent of a woman named Jael. Now, there's a lot more to the story, um, the story of Jael. I wish I could go into more detail. Um, and there's some really fascinating pieces about who Jael was and her connection um, with the Israelites. 
but I don't have time to get into that right now, so go home and make sure that you read these details on your own. Um, now, Jael welcomed Sisera into her tent, and by this time, he was quite exhausted. So Jael covered him with a blanket and gave him milk to drink. So just like a man, you cover a man up with a blanket, he's out cold pretty quick. So Sisera, he must have felt comfortable, or at least he was too exhausted to care all that much, because he fell quickly asleep in Jael's tent. Um, he did tell her to stand by and watch. But after he sleep, he fell asleep, Jael took a tent peg and hammered it into Sisera's temple, and he died. So just like Deborah prophesied, Sisera fell um, at the hands of a woman. Later, when Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, Jael said, Come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went into the tent with her, and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg right through her temple. Now God continued to give power to the Israelites until eventually um, they were all destroyed. Um, under Everyone under King Jabin was destroyed. So I want to move on now um, to Deborah. I didn't feel I could get into the character of Deborah, especially since some of us aren't very familiar with it, um, until I covered some context of what was happening in the book of Judges. So thank you for sticking with me. Um, we see that while the judges were all flawed and sinful themselves, God used them in mighty ways, just like many other heroes in the Bible. The author of the book that we're reading, some of you might have it, I don't know how many of you are going through it, but the life principles of the Bible, um, they, he gives us three reasons that God may have chose Deborah to play such a vital role in Israel's redemptive story. So the first... Um, the first reason that he gave was God may have used Deborah because of her weakness. Now, weak, weakness comes from 1 Peter 3, 7, when Paul talks about a woman being a weaker vessel. Now, weaker, we've talked about this, weaker doesn't necessarily mean worthless, but maybe rather fragile or of great value. We see that in the story of Deborah as um, as Deborah, a godly woman, acts as an incredible asset to God's redemptive story for Israel. When there is absolutely nothing we can do about a situation, we are rendered weak and anemic. It is when we are up against unimaginable odds that Christ's strength is made perfect. So moving on, um, God used Deborah because of her faithfulness. It is very clear Deborah had undeniable love and faithfulness to her Lord. In chapter 5, Deborah sings a song to the Lord, giving him praise and credit for their defeat of Jobin's army. She also was faithful in her steadfast obedience to what the Lord had for her. And third, he used her because of her availability. Um, just like the characters that we've learned about so far, Deborah was a simple and ordinary person, just like you and I, who made herself available for God to use. Now, I do want to go in, if you're anything like me, I want to um, touch on this a little bit. If you hear a unique story about Deborah, or like Deborah, in the position of a judge, then you might think back to our Titus II class and the role that we studied that we have as women. How is it that Judges 4 and 5 can exist in the same Bible um, with passages um, like Titus 2 and 1 Timothy 2, which explains to us how a woman should be submissive and to not assume uh, authority over a man. Now, this may seem contradictory and has definitely stirred up questions among Bible readers. So some people may take the story of Deborah as an example of a woman in leadership and then apply it to leadership to the leadership potential of all women for all time. So the argument may sound like, I mean, look at Deborah. Surely you could be a pastor. But this is where our biblical theology needs to kick in. Biblical theology, which is just the understanding of Scripture as one unified story, helps us have, have discernment in how we read and apply Old Testament stories like these um, just because it happened doesn't necessarily mean it's supposed to be modeled. You may have heard the phrase, narrative isn't normative. 
or descriptive versus prescriptive. Just because something in the in the story happened doesn't mean we're commanded to imitate it. Take the story of Ehud, for example. We're not going to imitate Ehud as a, um, as a judge. So this also applies to Deborah. Yes, she was a faithful woman of God who God chose to appoint as a prophetess and a judge. Yes, she served faithfully during a very dark time in Israel's history. And yes, we should glorify God for what he did through her as well as what he did through all the judges. But no, the story of Deborah should not be the go-to passage for how we as New Testament Christian women um, are to function. There are much clearer and more relevant passages and examples where the Bible is explicitly looking to answer those questions for us. So while we can glean so much from a character like Deborah and her faithfulness and obedience to the Lord, we must also remember that God had a unique role for her to play in, a, in his grand story of delivering Israel and then obviously down the line, Christ, which is also different than the role he has for us to play where we are in our life. Now let's move into some application as we zoom out and think about the overall story of judges all over again. Um, one of the greatest lessons we can learn from these chapters and even throughout the rest of the book of Judges is the cycle of sin, which I kind of tried to draw here, um, that the Israelites found themselves in. So, at, like I said before, as new generations arose in Israel, they would forget about the God of their father, and they would soon adapt uh, to life like the pagans. Um, there would be great sin in the midst of God's chosen people. So right here I put sin. Sin was... Um, the beginning of the cycle, as it is for all of us. Um, but then God would turn them over to their sin by allowing them to take over, to be taken over by an enemy and oftentimes oppressed for decades. So they would be oppressed, which I put God would turn them over to their sin. Um, but then God would, in his grace, send judges to call them back again and make things right with God. And there would be repentance and um, therefore a season of peace. Then the Israelites would get comfortable again, and that's where sin, the sin cycle, would start all over again. So isn't this so much, um, it's a very good example of how we are with our walk with the Lord oftentimes. We often find ourselves entrapped in the wickedness of our culture. We are easily influenced, and as a result, sinfulness starts to abound in our own life. God often allows things to happen in our lives as a consequence to our sin, and I know many of us have a testimony of living with the consequences of that sin for a very long time, sometimes decades, just like the Israelites, for a lifetime. But thankfully, by God's grace, he allows other believers to act as judges and speak truth into our lives, calling us to repentance. When we repent, we have great peace, but far too often, that peace and comfortability leaves us in a weak spot to be vulnerable to sin again. So I did want to get a little bit of feedback. Um, I liked how Akira last week kind of got some feedback and testimony from you guys. And I'd like you guys to think about um, in what ways has God used someone else in your life, another believer, um, to do a mighty work in your life, to maybe change the course that you were heading on in sin, um, and called you maybe to repentance or spoke truth to you um, where God can kind of use, was able to use his redemptive story.